Oh. Hey. <laughs> Starting to read Krishna book. And last night read the preface. And seemed to go pretty good. Seemed to but tonight I'm trying to read the introduction. I read it once and it was embarrassing. <laughs> so I I read through it again. And that was even worse. <laughs> and then I realized that this Krishna book is a very serious scripture. It's written like a, Papa wrote it like it was stories. I could read them to children, children's stories. But that's not what this is. <laughs> this is a very serious scripture. And it, it's, um, now I've I've read Krishna book before and I kind of know where everything is in in what chapter this pastime, that pastime. I I've read it actually several times and I've been with Association of Devotees and they we were reading also. And um, so I was hearing other people reading Krishna book. I'm going to try to read it again. <laughs> this is the third time tonight try, trying to read the introduction. And uh, I'm going to try. So, our Lord is the Srila Prabhupada. This is the introduction to Krishna book. Reading glasses on here. Krishna, 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 hey. Krishna, 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 hey. Krishna, 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 Rakshama. Krishna 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 Panima Rama Raghava Rama Raghava Rama Raghava Rakshama Krishna Keshava Krishna Keshava Krishna Keshava Panima While attempting to write this book Krishna let me first offer my respectful obeisances unto my spiritual master. Om Vishnupad 108 Sri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada. Then let me offer my respectful obeisances to the ocean of mercy, Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself, appearing in the role of a devotee just to distribute the highest principles of devotional service. Lord Chaitanya began his preaching from the country known as Godades, West Bengal. And as I belong to the Madhava Gaudiya Sampradaya, I must therefore offer my respectful obeisances to our disciplic succession. This Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya <clears throat> is also known as Brahma Sampradaya because the disciplic succession originally began from Brahma. Brahma instructed the sage Narada, Narada instructed Vyasadeva, Vyasadeva instructed Madhva Muni, Madhva Charni. Madhavendra Puri, the originator of Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya, belonged to the Madhva Charya disciplic succession 
He had many renowned disciples, both in the renounced and household orders of life. Disciples such as Nichinanda Prabhu, Dwaita Prabhu, Ishwar Puri. Ishwar Puri happened to be the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So let us offer our respectful obeisances to Ishwar Puri, Nichinanda Prabhu, Sri Dwaita Acharya Prabhu, Srivas Pandit, and Sri Gadadhar Pandit. Next, let us offer our respectful obeisances to Sarup Damodar, who acted as the private secretary to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And let us offer our respectful obeisances to Sri Vasudev Dutt and the constant attendant of Lord Chaitanya, Sri Govinda, and the constant friend of Lord Chaitanya, Mukunda, and also to Murari Gupta. And let us offer our respectful obeisances to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, Sri Rupa Goswami, Santan Goswami, Raghunath Bhatt Goswami, Sri Gopal Bhatt Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Raghunath Das Goswami. Krishna himself has explained in Bhagavad Gita that he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whenever there are discrepancies in the regulative principles of man's religious life and a prominence of irreligious activities, he appears on this earthly planet. In other words, when Lord Sri Krishna appeared, there was a necessity of minimizing the load of sinful activities accumulated on this planet or in this universe. For affairs of the material creation, Lord Mahavishnu, the plenary portion of Krishna, is in charge. When the Lord descends, the incarnation emanates from Vishnu. Mahavishnu is the original cause of material creation, and from him, Garbhadakshaya Vishnu expands, and then Shiradakshaya Vishnu. Generally, all the incarnations appearing within this material universe are plenary expansions from Shiradakshaya Vishnu. Therefore, the business of minimizing the overload of sinful activities on this earth does not belong to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself, but when Krishna appears, all the Vishnu expansions also join with him. Krishna's different expansions, namely Narayan, the quadruple expansion of Vasudev, Sankarshan, Padumi, and Aniruddha, as well as the partial plenary expansion of Matsya, or the incarnation of fish, and other Yuga avatars, incarnations for millennium, and the Manvantar avatars, the incarnations of Manus, all combine together and appear in the body of Krishna, Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is the complete whole and all plenary expansions and incarnations always live with him. When Krishna appeared, Lord Vishnu was also with him. Krishna actually appears to demonstrate his Vrindavan pastimes and to attract the fortunate conditioned souls and invite them back home, back to Godhead. The killing of the demons was simultaneous to his Vrindavan activities and was carried out only by the Vishnu portion of Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita it is stated that there is another eternal nature, the spiritual sky, which is transcendental to this manifested and non-manifested matter. The material world can be seen in the form of many stars, planetary systems, such as sun and moon, etc. But beyond this, there is a non-manifested portion which is not approachable to anyone in this body. And beyond that non-manifested matter, there is the spiritual kingdom. That kingdom is described in the Bhagavad Gita as supreme and eternal. It is never annihilated. 
This material nature is subjected to repeated creation and annihilation. But that part, the spiritual nature, remains as it is, eternal. The supreme abode of the personality of Godhead Krishna is also described in the Brahma Sanhita as the abode of Chintamani. That abode of Lord Krishna known as Goloka Vrindavan is full of palaces made of touchstone. There the trees are called desire trees and the cows are called sarabhi. The Lord is served there by hundreds and thousands of goddesses of fortune. His name is Govinda, the primeval Lord, and he is the cause of all causes. There the Lord plays the flute. His eyes are like lotus petals, and the color of his body is like that of a beautiful cloud. On his head is a peacock feather. He's so attractive that he excels thousands of cupids. Lord Krishna gives only a little hint in the Gita of his personal abode, which is the supermost planet in the spiritual kingdom. But in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna actually appears with all his paraphernalia and demonstrates his activities in Vrindavan then at Pratura, and then at Dwarka. The subject matter of this book will gradually reveal all these activities. The family in which Krishna appeared is called the Yadu dynasty. This Yadu dynasty belongs to the family descending from Soma, the god in the moon planet. There are two different Kshatriya families of the royal order one descending from the king of the moon planet and the other descending from the king of the sun planet. Whenever the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears, he generally appears in a Kshatriya family because he has to establish religious principles or the life of righteousness. And the Kshatriya family is the protector of the human race, according to the Vedic system. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared as Lord Ramachandra, he appeared in the family descending from the Sun God, known as the Raghuvamsa. And when he appeared as Lord Krishna, he did so in the family of Yaduvamsa. There's a long list of the kings of the Yaduvamsa in the ninth canto of the Bhagavatam. All of them were great powerful kings. Krishna's father's name was Vasudev, son of Surasam, descending from the Yadu dynasty. Actually, the Supreme Personality of Godhead does not belong to any dynasty of this material world, but the family in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears becomes famous by his grace. For example, sandalwood is produced in the states of Malaya. Sandalwood has its own qualifications apart from Malaya, but because accidentally this wood is mainly produced in the states of Malaya, it's known as Malayan sandalwood. Similarly, Krishna, Supreme Personality of Godhead, belongs to everyone, but just as the sun rises from the east, although there are other directions from which it could rise, so by his own choice the Lord appears in a particular family and that family becomes famous. When Krishna appears, all his plenary expansions also appear with him. Krishna appeared along with Balaram, who is known as his elder brother. Balaram is the origin of Sankrashan, of the quadruple expansion. Balaram is also the plenary expansion of Krishna. In this book, the attempt will be made to show how Krishna appeared in the family of the Yadu dynasty and how he displayed his transcendental characteristics. This is very vividly described in the Bhagavatam, specifically the 10th canto, and the basis of this book will be Srimad Bhagavatam. The pastimes of the Lord are generally heard and relished 
by liberated souls. Those who are conditioned souls are interested in reading fictional stories of the material activities of some common man. Narrations describing the transcendental activities of the Lord are found in Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas. But the conditioned souls still prefer to study ordinary narrations. They're not so interested in studying the narrations of the pastimes of the Lord, Krishna. And yet, the descriptions of the pastimes of Lord Krishna are so attractive that they are relishable for all classes of men. There are three classes of men in the world. One class consists of liberated souls. Another consists of those who are trying to be liberated. And the third consists of materialistic men. Whether one is liberated, is trying to be liberated, or is even grossly materialistic, the pastimes of Lord Krishna are worth studying. Liberated souls have no interest in materialistic activities. The impersonalist theory that after liberation one becomes inactive and needs hear nothing does not prove that a liberated person is actually inactive. A living soul cannot be inactive. He is either active in the conditioned state or in the liberated state. A diseased person, for example, is also active, but his activities are all painful. The same person, when freed from the diseased condition, is still active, but in the healthy condition, his activities are full of pleasure. Similarly, the impersonalist managed to get freed from the diseased conditional activities, but they have no information of activities in the healthy condition. Those who are actually liberated and in full knowledge take to hearing the activities of Krishna. Such engagement is pure spiritual activity. It is essential for persons who are actually liberated to hear about the pastimes of Krishna. That is the supreme relishable subject matter for one in the liberated state. Also, if persons who are trying to be liberated hear such narrations as the Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, then their path of liberation becomes very clear. Bhagavad Gita is the preliminary study of Srimad Bhagavatam. By studying the Gita, one becomes fully conscious of the position of Lord Krishna. And when he is situated at the lotus feet of Krishna, he understands the narrations of Krishna as described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Lord Chaitanya has therefore advised his followers that their business is to propagate Krishna Kata. <laughs> Krishna Kata means narrations about Krishna. There are two Krishna Katas. Narration spoken by Krishna and narration spoken about Krishna. Bhagavad Gita is the narration on the philosophy or the science of God spoken by Krishna himself. And Srimad Bhagavatam is the narration about the activities and transcendental pastimes of Krishna. Both are Krishna Kata. It is the order of Lord Chaitanya, that Krishna Kata should be spread all over the world because if the conditioned souls suffering under the pangs of material existence take to Krishna Kata, then their path of liberation will open and clear. The purpose of presenting this book is primarily to induce people to understand Krishna or Krishna Kata, because thereby they can become free from material bondage. This Krishna Kata will also be very much appealing to the most materialistic persons, because Krishna's pastimes with the gopis, cowherd girls, are exactly like loving affairs 
between young girls and boys within this material world. Actually, the sex feeling found in human society is not unnatural because the same sex feeling is there in the original personality of Godhead. The pleasure potency is called Srimati Radharani. The attraction of loving affairs on the basis of sex feeling is the original feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and we, the conditioned souls, being part and parcel of the Supreme, have such feelings also. But they're experienced within a perverted, minute condition. Therefore, when those who are after sex life in this material world hear about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis, they will relish transcendental pleasure, although it appears to be materialistic. The advantage will be that they will gradually be elevated to the spiritual platform. In the Bhagavatam, it is stated that if one hears the pastimes of Lord Krishna with the gopis, from authorities with submission, then he will be promoted to the platform of transcendental loving service to the Lord and the material disease of lust within his heart will be completely vanquished. In other words, it will counteract material sex life. Krishna will be appealing to the liberated souls and to persons who are trying to be liberated as well as to the gross, conditioned, materialist. According to the statement of Maharaj Prikshit, who heard about Krishna from Sukadev Goswami, Krishna Kata is equally applicable to every human being in whatever condition of life he is in. Everyone will appreciate it to the highest magnitude. But Maharaj Prikshit also warned that Persons who are simply engaged in killing animals and in killing themselves may not be very much attracted to Krishna Kata. In other words, ordinary persons who are following regulative moral principles of scriptures, no matter in what condition they are found, will certainly be attracted, but not persons who are killing themselves. The exact word used in Srimad Bhagavatam is Prashudna which means killing animals or killing oneself. Persons who are not self-realized and who are not interested in spiritual realization are killing themselves. They're committing suicide because this human form of life is especially meant for self-realization. By neglecting this important part of his activities, one simply wastes his time like the animals. So he is Prashudna. The other meaning of the word refers to those who are actually killing animals. This means persons who are animal eaters, even dog eaters, and they're all engaged in killing animals in so many ways, such as hunting, open slaughterhouses, etc. Such persons cannot be interested in Krishna Kata. King Parikshit was especially interested in hearing Krishna Kata because he knew that his forefathers, particularly his grandfather Arjuna, were victorious in the great battle of Kurukshetra, only because of Krishna. We may also take this material world as a battlefield of Kurukshetra. Everyone is struggling hard for existence in this battlefield, and at every step there is danger. According to Maharaj Parikshit, the battlefield of Kurukshetra was just like a vast ocean full of dangerous animals. His grandfather Arjuna had to fight with such great heroes as Bhishma, Drona, Karna, and many others who were not ordinary fighters. Such warriors have been compared to the Timangila fish in the ocean. Timangila fish can very easily swallow up big whales. The great fighters on the battlefield of Kurukshetra could swallow many, many Arjunas very easily, but simply due to Krishna's mercy, Arjuna was able to kill all of them, just as one can cross with no exertion over the little pit of water contained in the hoofprint of a calf. So Arjuna, by the grace of Krishna, 
was able to very easily jump over the ocean of the battle of Kurukshetra. Maharaj very much appreciated Krishna's activities for many other reasons. Not only was his grandfather saved by Krishna, but he himself also was saved by Krishna. At the end of the battle of Kurukshetra, all the members of the Kuru dynasty, both the sons and grandsons, on the side of Dhritarashtra, as well as those on the side of the Pandavas, died in the fighting. Except the five Pandava brothers, everyone died on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Maharaj Parikshit was at that time an embryo within the womb of his mother. His father, Abhimanyu, the son of Arjuna, also died on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And so Maharaj Pritchard was a posthumous child. When he was in the womb of his mother, a Brahmastra weapon was released by Asvatthama to kill the child. When Pritchard Maharaj's mother, Uddhara, approached Krishna, Krishna, seeing the danger of abortion, entered her womb as the super soul and saved Maharaj Pritchard. Maharaj Parikshit's other name is Vishnu Ratha because he was saved by Lord Vishnu himself while still within the womb. Thus, everyone in any condition of life should be interested in hearing about Krishna and his activities because he is the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead. He's all pervading. He's living within everyone's heart. And he is living as his universal form. And yet, as described in the Bhagavad Gita, he appears as he is in human society, just to invite everyone to his transcendental abode, back home, back to Godhead. Everyone should be interested in knowing about Krishna. And this book is presented with this purpose, that people may know about Krishna and be perfectly benefited in this human form of life. In the ninth canto of Bhagavatam, Sri Baladev is described as the son of Rohini, a wife of Vasudev. Vasudev, the father of Krishna, had 16 wives, and one of them was Rohini, the mother of Balaram. But Balaram is also described as the son of Devaki. So, how could he be the son of both Devaki and Rohini? This was one of the questions put by Maharaj Parikshit to Sukadev Goswami, and it will be answered in due course. Maharaj Prichit also asked Sukadev Goswami, why Krishna, just after his appearance as the son of Vasudev, was immediately carried to the house of Nanda Maharaj in Vrindavan, Gokula. He also wanted to know what the activities of Lord Krishna were while he was in Vrindavan and while he was in Mathura. And besides that, he was especially inquisitive to know why Krishna killed his maternal uncle, Kamsa. Kamsa, being the brother of his mother, was a very intimate superior to Krishna. So how was it that he killed Kamsa? Also, he asked how many years Lord Krishna remained in human society, how many years he reigned over the kingdom of Dwarka, how many wives he accepted there. A Chhatri king is generally accustomed to accept more than one wife, Therefore, Maharaj Prichit also inquired about his number of wives. The subject matter of this book is Sukadev Goswami's answering of these and other questions asked by Maharaj Prichit. The position of Maharaj Prichit and Sukadev Goswami is unique. Maharaj Prichit is the right person to hear about the transcendental pastimes of Krishna. And Sukadev Goswami is the right person to describe them. If such a combina fortunate combination is made possible, then Krishna Kata immediately becomes revealed and people may benefit to the highest possible degree from such a conversation. This narration was presented by Sukadev Goswami when Maharaj Pariksit was prepared to give up his body, fasting on the bank of the Ganges. In order to assure Sukadev Goswami that by hearing Krishna Kata he would not feel tired, 
Maharaj Pritchard expressed himself very frankly. Hunger and thirst may give trouble to ordinary persons or to me, but the topics of Krishna are so nice that one can continue to hear about them without feeling tired because such hearing situates one in the transcendental position. It is understood that one must be very fortunate to hear about Krishna Kata seriously, like Maharaj Pariksit. He was especially intent on the subject matter because he was expecting death at any moment. Every one of us should be conscious of death at every moment. This life is not at all assured. At any time one can die. It does not matter whether one is a young man or an old man, so before death take place, we must be fully Krishna conscious. At the point of his death, King Parikshit was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from Sukadev Goswami. When King Parikshit expressed his untiring desire to hear about Krishna, Sukadev Goswami was very pleased. Sukadev was the greatest of all Bhagavat reciters, and thus he began to speak about Krishna's pastimes, which destroy all inauspiciousness in this age of Kali. Sukadev Goswami thanked the king for his eagerness to hear about Krishna, and encouraged him by saying, My dear king, your intelligence is very keen, because you're so eager to hear about the pastimes of Krishna. He informed Maharaj Prichit that Hearing and chanting of the pastimes of Krishna are so auspicious that the process purifies the three varieties of men involved. He who recites the transcendental topics of Krishna, he who hears such topics, and he who inquires about it. These pastimes are just like the Ganges water, which flows from the toe of Lord Vishnu, they purify the three worlds, upper, middle, and lower planetary systems. And that's the introduction to Krishna Bhakti.